Hey, welcome back to the food forest. Today I want to do a little bit of an update video of the pond. I haven't really talked about the pond that much lately in my recent videos and there's some interesting things that I've done this year specifically with the plants that I've planted around the pond. So let's talk about it. What is my pond? Why do I have this pond? And uh, you know, what am I planting all around it and why? Stick around. So just a heads up, this video is pretty loud. We're gonna talk about the pond. So my apologies for that. I can't really do a whole lot of it. I tried to minimize the pond noise in the audio after effects. So just bear with me, but I wanna talk about the pond today and the plants that I have around there. I can't do that without standing by the pond and it's a little bit loud. Okay, so first things first, I actually have a detailed video where I go into the design aspects of creating a pond like this different things that you should actually design in in order to have a stable ecosystem that doesn't breed anaerobic bacteria because you can actually get giardia from your ponds. So be really careful about putting in ponds. Definitely check that video out if you haven't yet. Why do I have this pond? The land that I have now is about four acres and two of it is really swampy. Before I moved here, we lived in a subdivision and we were pretty much typical suburbanites. I, I personally wanted to buy a little bit of land because I wanted to create hiking trails in it. This was before I even got into gardening or permaculture at all. One of the things that I always loved was camping up in Algonquin Park and just the look and feel of what it is like up there at Algonquin. I've always wanted to reproduce something like that at my house. I certainly never thought that I would have something as epic and big as this. Now at the same time, as I actually moved into getting into permaculture, I actually started to realize that water is a key aspect of life diversity. And one of the biggest tenets of permaculture is to really value the marginal and value diversity. Not diversity for diversity's sake, but if you want to have pest-free fruit in your food forest, a really good way is to attract water-loving species like dragonflies. Not only that, but I also wanted a source of water for the birds. And this is one of the reasons why I really wanted to design in streams and waterfalls and slow moving areas. Let's go take a look at both the waterfall here and also down over this way, we'll take a look at the overflow river. The design of the waterfall is really so that it has a whole bunch of these tumble zones and pooling areas. And a big reason for that is so that birds can stop by, stand on little things that I've built for them, and then get little drinks of water. Here's the lower waterfall where the same design aspects are taken into consideration. We want lots of tumbling water for lots of oxygen. Now this area here is where the main pond body overflows over a rock back there. And this creates an actual skimming action to remove debris and send it downhill, down through this river. Originally, this plan for this area was to actually create a waterfall going down there and end it. But I really wanted the wildlife to have this slow moving river where it could come in and get water if it wanted. So this is that skimming action happening on the back side of the waterfall. And there's Harry checking us out. This will actually pull all the debris down around and into the lower waterfall. 
Now this time of year is not really the most beautiful around the pond because everything is still kind of gray and uh, dying back, just starting to wake up. But maybe we'll take a look at see, you know, what are some of the things that are actually coming back into life? What kind of things do I have planted in here and why do we have them planted? Okay, now one reason that we've planted things in here is for food. So this is ostrich fern which is fiddleheads. And it's a very common forage that people look for when they go out wild foraging. And I just thought, why not have some at my house so that I don't actually have to go wild forage. I know exactly where it is. And I actually don't have any competition with other people harvesting my fiddleheads. Look at them all in there. And right next to this one, we've got another one. And I'm actually standing on a whole bunch right now, making sure that I don't hurt them. I've also been spreading around a lot of dandelion, which I know people might think is a bit odd. But dandelion is a very, very good edible plant, and it's delicious early in the season. We've also got some Egyptian walking onions there. There's some dandelion flowers. We got solar lights to make it all look nice at night. Now my main reason for planting this was actually the insects. Because the insects are crashing at an alarming rate and we need to help them out. And a big part of what I wanted to do was really expand the native wildflower plants that I have here that bring in pollinators and also predators for any pests that I am experiencing in my food forest. So we see here a little row of lavender all along this cliff edge wall. We've got goldenrod right in here growing and we've got a ton of yarrow that's planted everywhere. I added some geraniums because I've heard that they're really good at attracting Japanese beetles. They kind of fall into the flowers and they're really clumsy and can't get out. But the whole reason we even have this is because we wanted a pool to swim in for the kids and I just thought a pool is going to be temporary and the kids will probably like it while they're teenagers and then never use it again and I'll be stuck taking care of it so I can do that or I can actually build something that will be both beautiful but also functional and can also be kind of like the beating heart of my food forest in the long term. I think a big reason why I don't have very many pest problems is because I have this pond You'll see in the summertime that I have tons of dragonflies just hovering all over this pond, hunting, 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 eating everything. You know, my thoughts on pests is if you have pest problems, you probably just don't have enough predators. So stop worrying about the actual plants that are uh, being eaten by the pests. Stop worrying about the individual pests and actually just start planting more flowers to attract the actual predators of the pests. You don't have a pest problem, you have a lack of predators problem. So we solve that and beauty um, function with just planting more and more native plants. So those are the things that are going to bring in the insects that you actually have in your local environment to hunt the pests. No point planting something that's not going to bring in an actual predator. So plant natives, plant lots of wildflowers. Don't forget about them. Add those into your food forest and all around your box gardens. Trust me, you'll have way less pests because you did that. Okay, in this small little area, we've got colt's foot here, which is a hardy medicinal. We've got dandelion. We've got some comfrey coming up. This here is Canada lettuce. It's a wild Canada lettuce. We've got geraniums. We've got a uh, American highbush cranberry. We've got another seedling here popping up. This here is zigzag goldenrod. This is some fiddleheads. This is some early goldenrod. We've got uh, evening primrose here, which is a beautiful flower. So you can see in this small little area right next to the pond, we've got a ton of diversity sitting right in and around behind this uh, service berry here. And then this is, I'm in this spot right here. This is just this tiny little corner 
where we've got all of these natives planted. Okay, moving down a little bit, we'll get into some more details of some of the things that's planted just along this shelf here. Okay, so first, right down at my feet, I don't think I've ever showed this, you know, besides the lavender here and the yarrow and dandelion, we've got this. This is actually soapwort. And, you know, part of prepping and being ready for anything is that you might not have access to a lot of things that you kind of would make life a little bit comfortable. Part of that is soap. So you can actually pull the roots out of this, boil it, and then take that water and use it as a cleaner. So I've turned around now. This was the area where I was showing you the soap wart before. You can see we kind of spread it all through here. We've got some more zigzag goldenrod, more soap wart, more yarrow. We've got a has cap cutting here. Um, we've got some more goldenrod and geraniums. And we've got here some marsh marigold. So marsh marigold is a medicinal plant. It does have some severe um, toxicity issues that you should be aware of. It has been used in the past, uh, historically speaking, but we put it kind of in this little corner so that it can't really spread anywhere. It doesn't like jumping over and getting into dry stuff. It'll only really sit here as the bees kind of drink some water. Kind of showing you, you know, why I have this. It's kind of neat when that little, when that kind of stuff happens. Uh, marsh marigold, you can use it for medicinal reasons. We have it here mostly because frogs just absolutely adore it. And we'll let it kind of take this quiet area out of the stream. Doesn't like flowing water, but it does like a little pooling area. So we thought this would be a nice little frog spawning ground here, a tiny little niche in the side of this river that we've got. Now, something I just found, poking in and around here, this is the side of this rock wall. And where we got this was up in Bruce County. And you can see that we've got a little, uh, a visitor that joined us here and got carried here from there and it's also now popped up here. This is actually meadow buttercup and it's a pretty nasty invasive uh, weed. The whole thing is also poisonous so this is something that I'll have to take you know, I guess some gloves on because I don't want to touch it and we'll get rid of it but it's always interesting when you bring things from somewhere else you know, what things were stowing away inside the side of the rock for your pond. So we're what, 20, 30 minutes in and all I've talked about is these two shelves off in the corner of this whole entire pond area. So when I say that I could really take three hours just slowly meandering through and showing you everything that I've planted all around, I'm not kidding. We've planted a ton of stuff all in and around this area. So we just walked along that edge here and we've got a ton of um, Black Eyed Susan rutabecchia growing in here. We've got some hoary plantain. We've got some dandelion and you can eat the dandelion flowers. Mm. And we've got St. John's wort here which is a very, very medicinal plant that bees absolutely love. It's in the bush layer, so it's a little bit bigger. So we got a bush layer plant there. We've got some more soapwort. Um, this is some more hoary plantain. Plantain is fantastic for uh, healing. If you wanna see a video where I cut my finger and then use this to actually heal, it's unbelievable how fast that healed. We've got oregano that we've established everywhere around here. And I'll just show you a little zoom out of how much it's everywhere. We've got more yarrow. We've got some creeping thyme, which is a great bee plant. It's also good for chickens. And we've got it right in around this little pawpaw that hasn't woken up yet. And you can see um, the yarrow does really well all on this cliff edge. Nice dry area. And it also, the oregano is just taken off. We've kind of spread the oregano just by seeds, just kind of you know, grabbing a bunch and just dropping it everywhere. And you can see it's really, really established well. Like even down in here in the walking paths. So we've got oregano everywhere, little patches, and we want that to fill in. So that we're basically walking on carpets of herbs, which is really, really cool. And then here we've got um, some bee balm 
down here in the bit of a shadier, wetter area that the bee balm will really do well. And you can see I just kind of crush all my cuttings from goldenrod, for example, and just drop it down. The bee balm comes right up through there. And this is right at the base of a service berry in this little nook. You can actually see we've got fiddleheads in here. And I should mention that the fiddleheads, you really do want to boil them because they have something called um, thianamine, I think it's called, something like that. And it has to be destroyed uh, by cooking. So you, you don't want to just eat them raw. Definitely want to cook those. We've got more goldenrod, uh, more oregano. So you can see that we really just spread everything everywhere, more yarrow dandelion you know I'll actually go collect dandelions and spread them out because what is flowering right now for the bees not that much but the dandelions are and I can actually eat the flowers you can eat the roots you can eat the leaves all of this is edible and it's very good it's very delicious and we've got clover and this actually might not be clover. This actually might be fenugreek. And it might be alfalfa. I don't know. Does anyone else know? It looks a little different than my other clovers. But I'm not saying I haven't planted a whole bunch of different clovers. It looks like clover. But I think it actually might be fenugreek. Let me know what you think. Well, I think I have to kind of get in. Um, Trish is going to be home soon and we're going out so maybe I'll leave it at this that was a pretty long tour I didn't show a whole bunch of stuff that I was hoping to find um, that I might have to find another day um, but we've got spotted joe pieweed bone net a bunch of different asters bottled gentian um, man we have so many different things maybe I'll leave a little link hard to think of them all off the top of my head of the ones that we didn't find and I'll just leave you with these gorgeous service berries that are starting to bloom. These are canadensis variety. These are planted for the wildlife. They have small little berries that are high in fiber that are good for humans, but the birds just go crazy about them. And we've got one, two, three down the bottom, four here. But then we've also got some other up top, which are more of the alnifolia variety, which are June berries, Saskatoon berries. Um, we have Lavellus. We have a whole bunch of different service berries. Really enjoy them. And actually, I should be careful because I'm walking right around some. So these are a bunch more here that we've planted. All around the wetland filter here. You can see we've got that same thing. Thyme, oregano, goldenrod. We've got some, looks like wild carrot that's coming up in there. And we have all of these service berries because I wanted to create a walkway around here. But then also um, down the road, hop over here a bit. Down the road, I want this whole wetland guild to be, you know, a, a cove of these service berries that you walk in between. And the pathways will kind of fill in. And I'll have to kind of prune my way through here. But that's the idea. These are super young. We just put them in last year. And um, hopefully they do really, really well. I should probably baby them a little bit just to make sure they do well. Maybe I'll baby these a little bit this year. You can see I also planted them out kind of on an angle because I want them to reach out and then up to get them off the path a little bit. And then also to have a really nice aesthetic of creeping out over this wetland filter here. So thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed this little plant tour of the things that are planted in and around the pond. And it's going to be very, very interesting and fun to see what kind of stuff pops up over the years. And I think we'll always add to this a little bit here, a little bit there. See you on the next one.